Welcome back. So the big move out west because of what this certain player has done on the, I was going to say the back of the basketball card. It doesn't sound as cool, to be honest. The back of the baseball card just rings and rolls off the tongue a lot more. But I'll say the resume, the track record, whatever you have it. For Clay Thompson, it's exemplary. He's a four-time champion. He is an incredible playoff performer. He's had some iconic NBA playoff games, including the one in Oklahoma City in a game six. And now, House, the Splash Brothers no more. Golden State moving on. And the Dallas Mavericks go and get Klay Thompson. I thought for sure he was going to go to the Lakers. Just the, the father-son connection. I thought the Lakers, LeBron trying to take less money. It didn't end up playing out that way. He goes to a team that's just got a flat-out better chance to win. That's all there is to it. Luka, Kyrie carried that team to a title or to a West title. Ran into trouble when they made it to the NBA Finals. Didn't have enough options. Didn't have enough shooting, whatever it may be. Clay's going to get a lot of looks. Clay's also not going to have the ball as much. As far as fit is concerned, House, you like the fit of Clay Thompson going to Dallas? In theory, it makes sense. I, I just wonder how much at this stage in his career Clay Thompson has left to give. Well, to me... It's a tremendous fit. And, J.J., I know the, the romantic in you. You want to look at the back of, of, of the car that you can hold. We just go to the basketball reference page. If there you, you want go. To... That does the trick. Back uh, the, the web page. Okay, you just that's go fine. To the bas basketball reference guy has it all. It's right there on one page. Um, and it is a, a, a luminous resume that we see associated with Mr. Clay Thompson. Now, for a whole variety of reasons, it makes sense that his uh, run with Golden State ended kind of the way it did. I know that there are some stories out there with some animosity and who was treated the right way and what was the communication like. And honestly, I don't care about any of that. That's all soap opera, save it for your mama drama that they can work on up in the Bay Area and, you know, point figures however they want. I thought what Dallas did in this offseason with really not an enormous set of, of financial tools, right? Because all we're talking about is the collective bargaining agreement and this apron and that apron and all the rest of it. But I think Dallas improved immensely because they turned uh, uh, Josh Green and Derek Jones Jr. into Najee Marshall and Clay Thompson. That is a significant improvement. Derek Jones Jr., kudos to that man for showing out the best year of his entire career in Dallas, went and got himself a bag with the Clippers. But when we saw him in prime time against the Boston Celtics, he was neither strong enough, physically strong enough, nor accurate enough on offense to help Dallas get into a competitive position with the Celtics. He was undersized and underexperienced. Clay Thompson is superior in both of those respects. Now, I think it's absolutely right to look at the impact that Derrick Jones Jr. had over the course of the entire regular season. What a defensive fulcrum he was for, for that team on the wing. For sure, as Dallas uh, acquired the assets post-trade deadline, Derrick jo Jones Jr. was a very nice compliment. But I think what Najee Marshall brings to the table more than makes up for the loss of, of, of Derrick Jones Jr., and I think this Dallas team is is ready to go. Clay is going to get the perfect touches under the perfect circumstances. He's never played with somebody who can distribute the ball that Lu the way that Luka Doncic can. It's set up for great success. And I'm not going to – let's get some health, man. Let's just have that team healthy as well because they're right there in that conversation for one of the top three teams in the West. And I'm here to tell you, it's only three teams in the West, fellas. We'll have yeah, this conversation. Yeah, I get that. We'll have this conversation. Very, Raheem, very bullish, our boy House, here on the Mavericks. Very, very bullish. And listen, I, I get it. I, I just, I have questions about what Clay Thompson you're getting. I know he's going to have something to prove. And, you know, you throw in that dangling carrot of motivation. But, you know, House, if you were telling me you were getting Clay Thompson from like four or five years ago, I'd be like, yeah, this is a, this is a slam dunk for the Mavericks. Uh, Raheem, I'm skeptical on what you're going to get out of Clay Thompson because he did not look I'm, like the same guy with the Warriors last season. I'm very skeptical. Um, and I think the big reason why is because I don't think Clay's defense is what it was. When you look at what he did on the court with the Golden State Warriors last year, I think he, he, they, he had a 118 defensive rating. And it was to the point where you had people saying, 
Brandon Pazinski should be closing games over Klay Thompson. So I, I do think he's going to bring shooting to the Mavericks, but I think what you lose with Derrick Jones Jr. is a great wing defender. So um, I'm a little concerned about that. I do like the addition of Najee Marshall, but I just think this team takes a little step back defensively um, at the expense of their offense, um, which, I mean, that could be a good thing because I do think they got a little bit exposed against the Boston Celtics, but I just don't, I don't see everything breaking their way for them the same way it did last year. I felt like they got really, really lucky. Um, and I don't see that happening this year. So um, I think they'll obviously be in the mix because you have Luka Doncic, but you know, Kyrie Irving's getting older. I just think some of the other teams in the Western Conference are better options, like the Oklahoma City Thunder. Okay, I'm glad you got there because House, you referenced the three teams that you see at the top of the West pecking order. To me, there is a clear-cut number one at this stage. Raheem just nailed it. It's Oklahoma City. And I would argue no team has had a better offseason than the Thunder. To go and get Alex Caruso and what he provides, toughness, defense, three-point shooting, winning intangibles, and to go get my guy Hortenstein, who was fantastic for the Knicks, and it takes so much of the pressure off of a guy like Chet Holmgren, where it's like, all right, Chet, you don't got a bang. Go do you, bro. Go block shots. Go hit threes. Go kind of freelance. And we'll let Hortenstein go and do the dirty work inside. And Raheem and I were all over this. The rebounding disparity ended up being problematic for OKC. Now they get a guy who's going to get after it on the grass. They're going to get more toughness on the perimeter. And they're bringing basically the rest of the team back. House, they're the best team in the Western Conference. I don't think it's close. I mean, way to go out on a limb, JJ. I would argue that you would argue they did the best. They did the best. Of course they did the best. They did the best. <laughs> they were in the best position to do something meaningful in this uh, off offseason. And they did it. They had well, the financial. I mean, you could have argued Philly with George, to be but fair. Those, who, who would be serious with that? I, I'm who would just be saying. I'm just that? trying to give you, with, give you with an option. PG yeah. two thirds? Nah, nah. Nobody. I, I, I think Philly did a good they job did with a good Paul job. George. They did. They did. But they did. Oklahoma City, they already had a higher floor That's already. That's and it. they just kicked it over to the top. They just raised their, their That's silver. right. That's right. We're, we're all in agreement. This is a family play. I told you guys at the beginning of the week that I was buying futures on Oklahoma City ahead of them signing Hartenstein because it looked like they were the front runners for it. And you know that market moved. I got them at 10 to 1 to win the NBA Finals. And I got them at plus 460 to win the Western Conference. Uh, and I was like fine with, with putting my money down. You got to wait, 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 wait for all of that to come to fruition. But I don't think those numbers are going to move back, you know, from where they are right now. I think they're seven to one to win the NBA uh, championship and they're in the low 400s or high 300s to win the West now. I don't think those numbers are going to slide because that team is built for it. They're built for it in the regular season and they're built for it now. In the playoffs, the, the the big frustration with the Oklahoma City and the, you know the Pod Father was on this, Rosillo was on this, is why Oklahoma City didn't do something over the course of last season with as close as they were to making it, you know, all the way through. Um, why didn't they acquire some of this size? And you know, you can't really argue with um, them getting the job done now. You can quibble with whether or not the same kind of opportunities were available for this quality of player that they've acquired. Alex Caruso wasn't available at the trade deadline. They weren't getting Caruso or Hartenstein That's last right. year. That's right. That's the, the point, right? So you got to give it up to Presti for the for the patience. And you would say they sacrificed this year's playoff run to get those guys some seasoning because because the, the 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 two Jays needed some of that playoff seasoning, especially SGA getting some playoff seasoning, Chet Holman getting some playoff seasoning. I think all of that, you know, history has taught us that a young team like that needs to go through it at least once. But in this era where every year we're swapping out a new champion at the top of the NBA, um, Oklahoma City's right there, gents. Okay. The top three you had, House. You're going to put Oklahoma City one. I'm with you on that. Who are you putting two and three? Minnesota two and Dallas three. The wow. Da no, da Denver. wow. No Denver. No Denver. What's the case for Denver? Who? Jokic. Yeah. Jokic. That's, That's a, my case. We watched that. <laughs> That's my we, case. I, I understand We watched that. it. 
What happened? <laughs> what happened? I would still we put them it. over. I would put them over Dallas myself. I'm with you on Minnesota. I'm with you on Minnesota. I go OKC Minnesota. I think I would put Denver ahead of Dallas. Here's the thing: you need to open up. Um, ESPN.com or whatever your website of choice basketball reference begins. Look at the Denver Nuggets roster. They're missing four veterans that were on that title team. Very crucial to, to the run. And they have done absolutely nothing to replace that talent. Now, the rumor is that they're trying to acquire Russell Westbrook. Let me ask you right now, JJ. Oh, I hate that. Honestly, <laughs> that, that makes me cringe. Well, before I, I almost want to take that back if they bring Westbrook into the fold, we to be put, honest with you. Before we do that, let me ask you this. Who's their best player off the bench? Who's the number one player off the bench for the Denver Nuggets? Who, who leads their putting, second unit? Are you putting Braun or Brown, however you say Bra his name? Kristen Braun is going to be their he starting start. shooting guard. No, he has that. to start. He has but, to start. So who's I the best player off the bench? That's a fair quest, fair counter. I got to think about that because I can't give you a good answer. I was going to say Braun, but he's going to be starting. Well, I'm not him. worried about you. The, Denver can't give me a good answer. That's the problem no, for Denver. But he, here's what I would counter with. They're the sort of team that can go and find vet minimum guys because of Jokic and Murray. You're Don't right. you get that sense? They, yes. they're, not like, they're not like a 10 seed where people are going to be like, oh, I don't want to play there. I feel like they can – no, for sure. Uh, maybe not get a great bench, but they can get some guys in there that say, hey, we want to go and ring chase. You know? But here's the, here's the problem. When you look at the Denver Nuggets last year, the biggest reason for their success was their starting lineup. And when you remove one of those guys from the starting lineup, they weren't as successful. Well, now you don't have Chris Strasburg. I mean, excuse me. Now you don't have Contavious called Caldwell Pope. And you're replacing him with Christian Braun, and the bench is even weaker. And then you're talking about bringing in Russell Westbrook, who, look, he's played with the who's who of NBA Hall of Famers at this point in time, and he hasn't accomplished anything. So if you ask me, they the attrition on this roster has like it's done too much damage for them to overcome. And you saw it in game seven. Jokic played the entire second half and he had he ran out of gas. And then you look at a guy like Jamal Murray. He's been injured, like he's gotten injured as just as much as any injury-prone superstar in this league. Like he tore his ACL a couple years ago, and last year he wasn't the same guy. So I don't know if Jokic can overcome this. I think he's in the similar situation as Giannis Antetokounmpo with the injuries that they've had there. I, I totally okay. agree, JJ. And here, here's the thing: the real problem is they paid Michael Porter Jr. all that money. They don't and have he stunk any for him last year. So that's too, the problem. Huh? They awful. have a Michael Porter Jr. problem. That's the whole thing. If he shoots lights out and he can be the two-way player that rises up to the level of the contract they are paying him, then they're in the mix. I absolutely positively will countenance them. We could we could have a good uh old-fashioned knockdown drag him out between Dallas and Denver on who the third best team in the West is. But if Michael Porter Jr shows up like he did in the playoffs this, the, that we just closed out, Dallas, is, I mean, Denver is cooked, in my humble opinion. Okay. Would they be better suited? I don't know if they can do this off the postseason that he just had. Raheem, are they better suited trying to shop Michael Porter to get a couple of pieces for him? Ooh, that's a tough one. They might um, be. They might they, be. They, they, they might be. I mean, but, I mean, you have to ask yourself who's available. Fair. I, I think that's that, that's the tough thing at this point in time because it's just, you know, you look at the Philadelphia 76ers, they got the top guy in Paul George, and if they didn't get him, they were in, in a world of trouble. You know, Tobias Harris just signed for like $52 million to the Detroit Pistons. So, like, who else are you going to get? So they're, they're pretty much stuck with this roster, and they have to just nail their draft picks and make moves around the margins, and I don't know if that's possible. Okay. Top three for house. OKC, Minnesota, Mavericks. I'm swapping Dallas for Denver. Raheem, who would you put in that three spot? Because I know you're going one, two. You put Minnesota, too. I know that. Yeah, it's definitely de it's definitely Oklahoma City and Minnesota. But I'm going to leave number three blank. I think a sleeper TBD? can emerge. You're going to class yeah. TBD? Okay. Be because I would not be surprised if the Memphis Grizzlies emerge. I would not be surprised if the New Orleans Pelicans emerge. I would not even be surprised at this point, and people are going to call me crazy, 
But I think this could be a resurgent season for the Phoenix Suns. Like, I think any one of those teams can emerge. And I like the move that the Phoenix Suns made to bring in Mason Plumlee. Like, I thought that was great because with Nurkic off the court, they really struggled. So, like, as I told you yesterday on Wise Wednesdays, I think the Phoenix Suns are a great bet to win the Pacific Division at plus 200. And we're completely out house, right, on Lakers, Warriors. Raheem's going to make the case for the Suns. You, you could sell me there a little bit better. I new coach, better year out of Beal, your buddy. I am out. I am not getting any involvement with the Lakers and the Warriors. Under no circumstance can I do that this year. If anything, the only involvement for them will be unders this year. That's it. Yeah, my my most favorite thing that I that I prepared for today is to ask you guys who the best team in California is because I know who I think the best team in California Sacramento? is. Sacramento. That, that's my answer. I think the Sacramento, Sacramento Kings. I don't think it's close. I don't think so either. And I think there's another move for them to make. They are in this conversation for Lowry Markinen, and they're in the conversation for for other potential, you know, sort of trade pieces that are out there. They have first round picks. They have, you know, expendable wing depth that would really help other teams like uh, Kevin Horner and uh, you know Harrison Barnes. But you know that would just be a vet kind of thing. I was surprised when when Dream made the case for Phoenix because when he said, y'all are going to think I'm crazy, I was sure he was going to say Houston because um, I'm not sleeping Interesting. on, I'm not sleeping on Houston Memphis. either. We know yeah, that. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sleeping on Houston either, but I just think that Pacific division is so weak now. Yes. I think the Clippers are taking a step back. I think the Lakers, they can't improve. The Warriors are trash at this point in time. I just think with the healthy roster, with Mike Budenholzer, who I have a ton of respect for, and you look at what he did with the Bucks. I mean, like Adrian Griffin and Doc Rivers, I mean, they haven't been able to match anything that the Mike Booten holders has done. So I think the Phoenix Suns are going to be a lot better. I think they're going to be healthier. And I think at bare minimum, they win that division. Well, they are pl- at plus 200. They're the favorite to win the division. But I'll just tell you guys that all the way down there, five to one plus 500, the Sacramento Kings, I'm in that space. And basically, I'm what I'm buying is, the fact that I do think they're going to make one more move and they're going to end up with a very deep uh, six to seven man um, ro- rotation. But I understand the case you're making for the Suns dream. And honestly, I don't even really uh, quibble with it. I do think Bullenholzer is going to ha- uh, have a, a material impact on that team. I just can't um, invest in any team with Bradley Beal on it. That's all. It's against my constitution. Yeah, I don't blame you. It's against I my constitution. That, but you know what? <laughs> I also like the idea of investing now in young teams and emerging yeah. teams. And Love I know it. Sacramento yeah. in many ways took a step back last year. Right. But two years mm-hmm. ago, we were talking about them as a top three seed in the Western Conference. They lost a hard fought, what, seven game series to the Warriors. They kind of profile as a team that should win a lot of regular season games if they just give a you know what on defense. That's really their biggest problem. And, and they don't have any injury. Like, they still ended up at 46 wins, and they missed Malik Monk, you know, for uh, a, a good portion of the la- latter part of the season. And and they missed De'Aaron Fox for a portion at the beginning of the season and still finished at 46 wins uh, last year. So, yeah, I, I like what you're talking about, JJ. Yeah. 